recording the story of Ted Lurie, who was for many years the editor of the Jerusalem Post. My first interview is with Judy and Tebby, who was the uh, secretary to the editor of the Post for many decades, starting in the 30s. Judy, when did you come to Palestine and under what circumstances? I came to Palestine in uh, August 1935 with my father, brother, and sister. Were you married at the time? No, I wasn't married at the time. I was only 18 then. What was your maiden name? My, name na my maiden name was Grabelski. Now, your father and mother were well-known American Zionists, I believe. Right. In the, in the early 1920s, my father, whose name was Boris Grabelski, was treasurer of the Zionist Organization of America. And my mother was editor for a, sh a period of about a year of a children's magazine in Hebrew called Eden. Had you qualified in any way in America before you came to Palestine? No, I just finished uh, one year at uh, New York University where I studied business administration. Well, what did you do when you first came to the country? When we came to, uh, we lived, we lived, came to Jerusalem where, we, uh, where I've been living ever since, and I found a job at the Department of Agriculture of the uh, British uh, government at the time. And How long did you work there? I worked there for about six months and then um, moved over to the Jewish National Fund or the Karen Kai Emmet, where I worked for another uh, couple of months. And then in February 1936, uh, got a job at the Post as Gershon Agronsky's secretary. I'm going to read you a couple of quotations from the very first issue right. of the paper in which Gershon Agron outlined his policy. The Palestine Post at the time. That's right. This was on December the 1st, 1932. He explained his objectives in a front page editorial as follows. The sole object of the new management is to publish a daily paper responding to the needs and tastes of British residents, other Europeans, Palestinians. It is published in Jerusalem in the interest of the entire population of the country. Nothing Palestinian will be alien to the Palestine Post. Out there that he has used the word Palestinians, who were these Palestinians since the word has now got a rather loaded meaning? We were all Palestinians. We had uh, any, any resident of the country or anybody who was, uh, I'm sorry, not resident, anybody who was born in the country immediately received a Palestinian, a Palestinian citizenship. And if he went abroad, had a British passport uh, written at the bottom, Palestine. This applied to both Jews and Arabs. Both Jews and Arabs. So as far as you know, was uh, Agron aiming at, or Agronsky as he then was, aiming at serving both Jews and Arabs impartially? Right, right. Uh, would you say that this editorial policy was that which he was applying when you started with him in 1936? I think as far as I can uh, remember, the policy was continued all the time, even after Ted Lurie continue, uh, took over the paper. And uh, during the many years that uh, Ted Lurie served as Agron's uh, right-hand man, would right. you say that he was a party in this policy of providing a newspaper to serve the needs of uh, everyone in the country, English, Jew, Arab, the lot? Definitely, definitely. Somebody has written about Agron, I quote, like many Americans, Agron was a great admirer of English attitudes, and he quarreled with the British more in sorrow than in anger. Later, his original concept of His Majesty's loyal opposition became harder and harder to maintain, as the administration's policy turned more and more viciously anti-Jewish. Would you say that is a correct uh, description of what happened? I think that was definitely a uh, correct description. In other words, the paper started off trying to be, shall we use the word, even-handed. Neutral. Right? <laughs> Neutral, yeah. as far as the British administration was concerned. Right, right. And, right. and later this became increasingly hard to maintain this attitude. Uh, particularly after the white paper. Yes. Now, when was the white paper? It, uh, 39, I know. It was not 39. And, uh, and then uh, the policy was to uh, fight, the, uh, fight the white paper. Uh, carry on, it's a Ben-Gurion quotation. Uh, fight we, the white paper, but 
Uh, I'll tell you what it is. Continued we will fight the, the white war. paper as if there was no, no war. war. We will fight right. the war as if there was no yeah. white paper. And that also was adopted by the paper. But I mean, of course, the, uh, the Palestine Post. Judy, I want to go back a bit to the days of the 30s. I know that there were many famous journalists or people who afterwards became famous who worked for the Post in those early days. We have already mentioned uh, Gershon Ogronsky and uh, Ted Lurie. Who else was there? There was Leah Bendor, who uh, worked, uh, started working also in 36, and she later became, after Ted Lurie died, she became editor of the Jerusalem Post. There was George Lifftime, who uh, before the uh, state was uh, worked at the foreign desk. He later became a uh, famous uh, writer and authority on international affairs. There was also Zev Lacker, who specialized in uh, communism and also international affairs, who was well known in um, England and America. I think he even uh, became a professor at some American university. That's correct. Then uh, there was Julian Meltzer, who after, after working for a long time at the Post and uh, at Reuters office in Jerusalem, uh, moved over into uh, the Weizmann Institute at Rakovot, where he was in charge of PR, wasn't he? Public oh, relations, I, I think. I would say he became much more than that. He became yeah. Maya Weisgall's right-hand right. man. Right, yeah, you're right, and, yeah. And worked with Weisgall for many yeah. years. And uh, anybody and Then there was uh, Roy Elston, who was a, uh, who at, uh, was a British, uh, correspondent of the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation until the war broke out when he was uh, enlisted in uh, psychological warfare, came out to Cairo and then Jerusalem, and uh, began writing under a uh, pseudonym, of, under the pseudonym of David Courtney, a column in the paper known as Column One. Now, Judy, your official job was secretary to the editor. What, in fact, were you doing? Uh, practically everything, because in those days we didn't have, uh, there was no telex service between the branches, uh, between our branches in Jerusalem, uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa. The uh, telephone service was very bad, but uh, we would have, um, uh, kept contact with Tel Aviv and with Haifa every evening by telephone when the uh, news reporters would dictate material, the reports of the day to me and I would take it down straight on the telephone, holding the telephone on my left shoulder. And did you do other chores as well? Uh, everything, uh, including wash, washing up the dishes <laughs> <laughs> when necessary. Judy, who were the readers of the Post at this period? Uh, the readers of the Post were the uh, few English-speaking uh, residents, uh, people who had settled in the country, and uh, the numbers were increased in the... Uh, after Hitler came into power and um, emigration began, uh, came from Germany. The German Jews uh, all, of course, read the, the Jerusalem Post because they knew no Hebrew. Then uh, there was also uh, the uh, British members of the administration here and um, British uh, soldiers who, uh, whose numbers were also increased when the riots began in 1936. The great rise in circulation was, of course, after World War II began in uh, 1939. And that continued uh, till, uh, for, uh, till the end of the British Mandate. There was a time also, there was a time when the paper was sent, of course, to Egypt by train and to Lebanon and Syria. Looking at uh, issues of the post during this period of the World War II, I'm struck by the fact that it is geared to the uh, tastes of the Tommies. There's lots of cricket news and things like that, which yeah. I'm sure were not of great interest to the Yekas that right. you mentioned earlier. Uh, and yet, throughout this period, the relations of the paper with the British administration were declining. Is that correct? Yeah, that's definitely correct, because uh, that was the attitude of the British government uh, in, the home, uh, in uh, England and uh, was reflected through the uh, administration here. And was this quarrel with the authorities affecting you people at your work in the office? Well, there was the question of censorship, of course. We had, um, the, uh, we had uh, an office of the censorship uh, in our building, 
and all material uh, had to be submitted. Everything uh, that was uh, scheduled for the next day's paper had to be submitted in galley form to the censor. And do you have any quarrels with the censor? There were quarrels. Material was censored. And um, there was a one particular incident when a, a leading article was censored. Yes, I'd like to read to you something about that, because that was the famous editorial entitled Sursum Corda, written by Dr. Norman MacLean, then the moderator of the General Assembly, of, or who had been the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, and was at that time the chaplain of St. Andrew's Church. In Jerusalem. That's right. Now, according to the record, uh, Hanukkah and Christmas happened to coincide at this, on this particular year, and uh, that was 1940, and uh, he wrote an editorial all about uh, peace and how wonderful it would be for the people of the different uh, faiths, which was censored in its entirety by the censor Owen Tweedy, who was an Irish Catholic. Do you remember that incident? The, um, it was, the article was not published, but afterwards appeared in a British publication, which published it in full, including the story of the censorship. But the com the, the, their comments were also banned in the country. Dr. McLean afterwards mentioned the incident in, his, in a book he wrote entitled His Terrible Swift Store, a Sword, which was also banned in Palestine. Anything else uh, arise because of the troubles with the administration? Uh, well, we were all, all of us, all uh, very much conscious of the fact that uh, our telephones were tapped, and we would speak in uh, Hebrew in slang and uh, try to uh, get around things when we wanted to mention things which we didn't want them to understand. You assumed the censor didn't know any Hebrew slang. Uh, yeah, that's what we assumed. This Irish Catholic. We also had some sort of code words which uh, we all of us knew about and uh, got around it that way. But uh, we, we definitely would hear clicks on the phone at, uh, from time to time, which we knew either they were coming on or going off. <laughs> uh, I believe that Ted Lurie was also working at this time for the Haganah or for the Mossad in some way. Did you know anything about that? No, I did not know that. In those days, uh, were, the, the word Mossad was taboo. Nobody even mentioned it when you spoke to your, your brother-in-law or something like that. And uh, everything was kept quite secret. Let's jump uh, a long way, right past the war, and we come to uh, the end of January, beginning of February 1948, when the paper was bombed. Were you working for the paper then? I was working for the paper then. Um, I was heavily pregnant at the time, and uh, the one incident that uh, stands out in my mind was that on the 31st of January, I um, hired one of the uh, cleaning women to come in, especially during the day. Normally they worked in the very early hours of the morning cleaning up the office to uh, make a thorough house cleaning of Gersh Nagronsky's room. He at the time um, had been in London, and was returning that day to Tel Aviv and the following morning to Jerusalem. Uh, we worked hard. I had trouble keeping my stomach out of the way of the books when we were cleaning the books, dusting everything, and the room was in tip-top uh, shape uh, awaiting his arrival the next day. And that was one of my great regrets when uh, the, I heard, uh, well, when the, the, the place was bombed, I said, oh my God, <laughs> the, room, the room is dirty. <laughs> and did the bombing put the paper out of action? Uh, the bomb did not put the paper out of action. Um, and that was where Ted Lurie uh, played a great part that night. I wasn't working that night, but uh, that was uh, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, 10, 10.30 in the evening. Ted used to take a break and uh, normally met Sila, either went home to have a cup of coffee and have a late supper before returning to work or would meet uh, his wife Sila in town. That night, they were, supposed, they were meeting at, the, at a cafe in Ben Yehuda Street, which is about a four-minute walk from the post. And just as they got to the building, they, uh, to the cafe, they heard a, um, a powerful bomb. The bomb went off. They didn't know where it was. And um, Ted immediately uh, decided that he would rush back to the post to see what happened. As they were walking up the street, of course, they saw uh, smoke coming out of the building of the post. Uh, casualties were cleared. 
uh, fire brigade came, fire broke out of the building, uh, but uh, Ted nevertheless immediately went and made arrangements with a small press in the vicinity to put out a very small paper uh, uh, the next morning, uh, that evening, and was uh, distributed to subscribers in all over the country and uh, put on the newsstands the following morning, a little bit later than usual, but it was there nevertheless with a very strong column one written by David Courtney on the uh, bomb outrage. So that was really Ted's... Uh, that was Ted's initiative. initiative yeah, that was his, yeah. Team. What happened after that? Well, I was a little bit out of things then because uh, my doctor decided that I, was, I had to stop working at the time. There was too much tension at the office. And uh, I had my second son on, in April, on April 13th, 1948, the day the Hadassah convoy was attacked. Was and uh, when did you get back to the paper? I got back to the paper in September of 48. That was after the state had arrived. I was after the state and uh, when things were beginning to settle down. Well, how did you find things as far as the Palestine Post was uh, concerned? It was still called it the Palestine Post. It was still called the Palestine Post. The paper was uh, much smaller. Uh, the number of pages had been cut down. Circulation was drastically reduced uh, owing to the fact that the, the British had left the country. Advertising was low, but uh, things were beginning to pick up. And uh, you went on working, again as secretary to Agron. Right. And uh, then he, uh, Agron left for a year to join um, uh, Moshe Charette and Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv as the government's first director of information, leaving Ted Lurie in charge of the paper for, uh, during that period. Now, the records show that Ted had a pretty difficult job at this time because, as you already said, the circulation had dropped right. out of sight with the departure of the British. And uh, also, the cause had departed, the cause of fighting the British administration uh, and the Mapai people whom the Post had always supported had suddenly become the government. So there's no point in going on attacking the government, I should imagine. No, there was no point. But there was a change in policy then, and uh, that was described as... Uh, that the Post suddenly found itself overwhelmed with a sense of responsibility that yeah. it hadn't had before. Yeah, that... Uh, right. I, went, I continued working until the, the summer of 51 when I stopped uh, to take care of the children. And you were away for a long time. I was away for about uh, 10 years until one day Ted Lurie telephoned and said, what, what about coming back to work? And you did. And I did. <laughs> right. Judy, exactly when was this? What was the date? This, I came back to work on the 1st of January, 1962. Now, at that time, what was the position of the paper as you found it? Uh, the, pos uh, the paper was... Uh, was why? Well, let me help you a bit. Yeah. Was that uh, still during the Levon affair? Or was the Levon affair? The Levon affair, affair was uh, sort of uh, dwindling out to a certain extent, but there was still the uh, the big fight was going on between Ben Gurion and Eshkol, and the paper uh, that is Ted Lurie and his immediate aides uh, took the part of uh, Ben Gurion quite you openly. Do you know why Ted was so strongly pro uh, Ben Gurion? Yeah, you know, that I'm afraid. What was behind that? I'm afraid I don't know. Only it was quite obvious that the paper was supporting Ben Gurion, particularly after and particularly after the Rafi uh, Ben Gurion split from Mapai and formed the Rafi Party in the uh, '64, I think it was. And uh, he took with him Moshe Dayan and Shimon Peres and yes. a few others. Yes into Rafi. Right. And Ted was steadily supporting uh, Ben-Gurion right. against uh, Eshkol. Yeah. That, that was at the, prior to the 65 elections to the Knesset. And in those elections, uh, Eshkol succeeded uh, quite overwhelmingly against Rafi. Yes, but Rafi had uh, quite an... Uh, had, I don't remember exactly how many seats they had in the Knesset. I think they had about... I think yeah. it was about 12, was Ten it? 10 or 12, I yeah. think so, yes. Yeah, but uh, for practical purposes, Eshkol was right. back in party and the old Mapai was firmly uh, mm -hmm. ruling the show. Yeah. Uh, Golda Meir, I believe, was then the secretary general of the party. Uh, 
yes, of the party and uh, took a... She took a very dim view of Ted's uh, being pro-Ben Gurion. Exactly, exactly. And, and when Gulda took a dim view of anything, she tended to crack the whip. Yeah, uh, at that w about that time, uh, she was instrumental in, uh, uh, she wanted, uh, apparently she wanted very much to um, force Ted to resign or to kick him out. Yes, and why didn't she, do you know? The story at the time was that uh, Louis Pincus, who was uh, either at the time treasurer of the Jewish agency or already chairman, um, dis uh, intervened. He was a member of the board, I believe. He was a member of the board, yes. Yeah. And um, he uh, was successful in installing a, what, what should we call him, a commissar, <laughs> quotes, yes. called Francis Offner, a journalist uh, who worked in Tel Aviv. And Offner's official capacity in the party was... In the party, I I'm don't sorry, I don't mean in the party, I mean in the, on the paper. He was uh, more or less a deputy editor. He uh, sat quite quietly in a room of his own. Nobody paid very, very much attention to him. He would read galleys every night. And uh, then at the outbreak of the 67 war, he went back home to Tel Aviv one evening and never returned. Ah, before he did this, yes. uh, do you know if he passed uh, as, a, as a sort of censor on editorials or anything? He read editorials, but uh, I, people didn't pay very much attention I to him. I see. Huh? Now, then you, after the Six-Day War, he'd gone back to Tel Aviv. And never came back. And this, uh, this trouble all disappeared, I take it. Yeah. Rafi disappeared, mm -hmm. Dayan came in as Minister of Defense right, into right. the alignment. And uh, that it quieted down. It quieted down. Yeah. Now, I'd like you to cast your mind back earlier to a positive thing that right. happened prior to the Six-Day War something uh, for the paper that I think must be obviously very positive was the entry of uh, new capital through In, a new company. Yes, a daughter company of the Palestine Post Limited was formed called Jewish, uh, the Jerusalem Post Publications Limited, which uh, was responsible for the publication of the overseas the uh, weekly overseas edition of the Jerusalem Post. Although this had already appeared some it years before. It began in 1915, it began publication in, I think in 59, and uh, prior to that, uh, Gron had tried to interest uh, Sam Rothberg, who was the head of the Israel Investment Corporation, into investing money in this. But uh, it took many years. It took many years, and finally, uh, the uh, new corporate, uh, the new company, was founded in '64. Now, what was the idea of this weekly that went overseas? The weekly was a. Um, what should I? Uh, the weekly was uh, consisted of articles, news stories, and editorials that appeared during the week. Uh, uh, during the previous week in the daily issue of the Post. It was printed on airmail paper and sent abroad. And would it be fair to say it was uh, brought out for Zionist reasons, to reach uh, Zionists abroad? Uh, well, people were interested in reading the Jerusalem Post, but owing to the uh, heavy, uh, heavy airmail charges, it was impossible to, uh, uh, to ask people to subscribe to the daily airmail issue. It was then decided to have the weekly issue, which was sent out specially at a much uh, uh, much cheaper rate. Yeah, have you any idea who are the subscribers? Uh, to, uh, today, uh, today uh, we have about 45,000 subscribers around the world. That's really good. Taking Israel to the world. Yes. And I, I think it's fair to say that for somebody abroad, this must give the most accurate picture of uh, Israel that's obtainable. Yes, that's quite definite. And it gets to uh, its destination uh, within a few days. That's why I said it had yeah. a, a Zionist right. function. Right. Now, uh, after the Six-Day War, uh, Israel flourished, and I believe the Jerusalem Post also flourished. Business was good. 
uh, there was a uh, increase in Anglo-Saxon immigration, English-speaking people. Uh, circulation went up. Uh, advertise uh, business was better, so advertising went up, and the paper was again in the black. And what did Tid do as a result? Uh, he became quite fanatic about buying a new press for the paper. A um, what is it? It was a gas um, offset. Uh, was this the first of its kind to be? It was the first of its kind to be installed in Israel, and the um, the machine arrived and began working in uh, November or December of 1970. The fact that it was such a big machine uh, forced us to look around for a new building. The old building we uh, we had in the center of the town was much too small. The press could not accommodate the new machine, and so a new building was bought in Romema, the building we're in today. That and was taken over from Tnuva? Yes, we bought it from Tnuva. Yeah. And uh, the, the rooms we sat in, I think, were the ones where the chickens were kept. Chickens and fish were kept. Upstairs there were the uh, administrative offices. And the place was, of course, remodeled and renovated and tr transformed completely. And this proved to be a great success. Definitely. Both the building and the press. Yes. And uh, the paper is printed much nicer than any other paper. Pictures come out very clear. And in general, it looks much nicer. So uh, I would say that uh, the post, as it appears today, is quite a tribute to Ted's uh, administrative... Uh, and obstinacy in uh, insisting upon buying this uh, I was going to put it more politely, <laughs> say administrative <laughs> drive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he was quite... Uh, insistent upon that, even though there were objections from all over the place. And uh, this would take us then to the uh, early 70s. Yes. We, uh, the, uh, the post itself, the press moved first, and uh, the post itself moved a year later in uh, November 71, just in time to uh, get organized and have a very nice uh, big birthday party on the 40th an uh, anniversary of the post in the new building. But I think the party was delayed a year. The, the 40th anniversary was 72. 72, yes, That's until right. we but got organized. And then, uh, and then uh, Ted had this, uh, all of a sudden, it, it had to be postponed because he had a, gall a sudden uh, gallbladder operation in May. And that's right, right, I remember. So... Uh, and by that time, um, Golda Meir was Prime Minister of Israel, and was invited and attended the party. She was the guest of honor of the party. And I think for the sake of the record, since we have blamed her, if it was blamed, <laughs> for being so opposed to uh, Ted. Ted over the uh, Rafi party business, she certainly seemed to bury the hatchet yes, when she spoke did. at that party. She did. She was very enthusiastic about the post, uh, the post's role. And she remained so till she died? I think so. She was on much better terms with the post after that, yes. Yeah. And uh, after that, unfortunately, it wasn't long before Ted himself died. Now, he died quite suddenly uh, when, while attending a uh, annual uh, conference of the International Press Institute in Tokyo. He was a member of the board of governors of this institute and uh, collapsed there and died. Well, if a great journalist has to go, I suppose it's a dramatic way to do so. Right. Without knowing what hit him, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Judy. Yeah.